Hello, my name is Taylor Green with Mississippi State University Extension and welcome to Healthy Home Solutions for Healthcare Providers, an update on lead. Here are the learning objectives for today's program. As a result of viewing this video, you'll be able to list the connections between health, well-being, and the home environment, consider lead hazards in the home and your nearby environment, and list actions that can be taken to reduce lead risk in the home. Blood lead poisoning is a class two and class three reportable disease. Blood lead level testing is targeted at the following age levels in the state of Mississippi. Bright Futures recommends screening at-risk children at six, nine, 12, 18, and 24 months. However, in Mississippi, we generally target ages 12 and 24 months if me Medicaid eligible, between six and 72 months if the risk assessment indicates exposure, annually with risk factors, and any time when medically indicated in a workup of some unexplained illnesses. Here's what you as a provider should know about lead. Lead is a heavy metal. It can be toxic to the human body Lead poisoning remains the number one environmental threat to America's children. For most children, our lead exposure is occurring in the home. Young children are particularly susceptible to the effects of lead poisoning. However, lead has had a lot of good uses throughout history, such as in our maritime paints and in other hostile environments. It only takes a small amount of lead to cause big problems in developing children. It is toxic to both humans and animals. So while we're talking about the risks of lead poisoning, our main mission is to emphasize that lead poisoning is entirely preventable. There is no amount of lead in the body that can be considered safe. When working with your patients, you want to consider that there are many potential lead sources and sources of exposure. Lead is an element, atomic number 82, it occurs naturally in our soil, rocks, and water. It's also been used throughout human history as an additive for a wide variety of products. For instance, when you add lead to paint, it makes for smooth coatability, it enhances color, and it helps resist corrosion. This makes it especially helpful underwater where it's still used today. When added to plastics and vinyl, Lead provides rigidity and sturdiness. It's also been used as a flame retardant in a number of products, among them artificial Christmas trees and light strands. The US government banned most lead-based paint in 1978. And today, virtually all American-made products are lead-free. However, consumers need to be cautious in purchasing imported goods. Some of those are known to contain lead, but we'll consider that more later. Lead was banned from house paint in 1978 by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. That means that any home built before 1978 may contain leaded paint. The older the home, the greater the likelihood that the paint contained lead additives. It's not possible to determine whether a pre-1978 home contains lead-based paint without testing. However, when considering your patients, you want to think about the age of the home that they spend the most of their time in. You might want to assume that a home built before 1978 contains leaded paint or consider that in your risk assessment. For example, homes built pre-1940, 87% contain lead paint. Houses built between 1940 and 1959, 69% contain lead paint. And those built until 1978, 24% still contain lead paint. So when we consider lead exposure, we frequently think about ingesting. However, inhalation is also a significant risk and we would consider it to be the main problem in lead exposure. As paint deteriorates, it may flake, chip, or degrade to a fine dust. Ingestion of our lead dust during hand-to-mouth contact is a common exposure route. Lead dust is virtually invisible and easily dispersed into the air. And ingesting by swallowing lead chips or 
inhaling the lead dust causes our elevated blood lead levels. So while all lead paint will deteriorate with time, some areas are especially vulnerable. These are the areas that have the most traffic or most use. You want to consider the windows, doors, stairs, and banisters. This is where most frequently you're touching things, you're opening things, and this can cause the paint to degrade at a faster rate. However, many homeowners and landlords have repainted surfaces that were originally covered with our lead-based paint. If this repainting occurred before the lead paint began to degrade or while it was still in good condition, the lead-based paint is still there, it's just underneath. And as long as the new paint remains in good condition, the lead-based paint underneath shouldn't be a problem. This is generally true for walls and ceilings. However, it is a problem in our vulnerable areas, including windows, doors, stairs, and banisters. Weathering, friction, and human handling mean that paint degrades rapidly on these surfaces. Paint in these areas, unlike our walls and our ceilings, cannot be safely maintained. Paint on the exterior of the house is also subject to weathering. Lead paint chips and dust are likely to settle in the soil near the homes. So for this reason, we ask that children avoid playing in the grass or soil in the immediate vicinity of the house. Also, if there's any vegetable gardens or any food being grown on the property, we recommend that gardens be located as far away from the house as possible. You also want to consider homes that are near busy roadways. They may can have lead contaminated soil resulting from previous leaded gasoline residue. If possible, we ask that people consider planting raised garden beds with new soil to avoid the exposure to your vegetables by lead dust. This is a good resource for patients and providers. It's the EPA's danger zone finder. This helps consumers and patients recognize the locations in their homes where lead contamination is most likely. And remember, you don't know if your home contains lead without testing. So now we want to consider the health effects of lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is a health risk for people of all ages, not just young people and children. However, in children, physical symptoms associated with lead poisoning include headaches, stomach aches, and sleep problems. Children may also experience hearing difficulties. These symptoms, if experienced at all, may be mild and easily dismissed as any number of other minor childhood maladies. The biggest danger associated with lead poisoning and lead exposure is neurological in nature. Children can experience delays in brain development if exposed to lead in early childhood. However, we still want to consider that lead poisoning can have a significant health effect on adults. In adults, it generally manifests itself as anemia or high blood pressure, often experienced by middle aged to older adults anyway, thereby exacerbating their condition and perhaps going unnoticed and undiagnosed. Fertility and reproductive problems may also be experienced by both men and women, and kidney damage is often a problem. Some cognitive impairment, such as memory loss, is also possible. Since we consider the neurological impacts of lead to be the most significant, we'll go into that in more detail. Infants and young children are particularly vulnerable to lead poisoning. Here's how it works. A baby is born with most of his or her lifetime supply of brain cells. In the early years, from birth through age five or six, those brain cells are making connections called synapses. Lead poisoning deters the formation of synapses and damages the myelin coating on the neurons in the brain. Failure to accomplish complete synaptical development means that children lose their full intellectual potential. Here's the outcome of that. The damage that ensues can affect a child's behavior. Lead poisoned children experience learning difficulties like the inability to concentrate, attention deficit disorders, and may exhibit tendencies toward violent behavior as well. However, the majority of lead poisoned children may not exhibit any outward symptoms of illness 
or symptoms may be so vague as to be mistaken for any number of minor childhood maladies. For this reason, your role as a provider is essential in screening young children for lead poisoning in, to avoid irreversible brain impairment. You may have heard that in 2012 the CDC revised the lead reference level. This has been cut in half the blood lead level at which case management is indicated. Previously it was 10 micrograms per deciliter and now it's 5 micrograms per deciliter. So at their well child checkups at 12 and 24 months of age, babies should be screened for lead exposure and elevated blood lead levels. Moreover, you as healthcare providers should continue to pose the lead poisoning screening questions of the parents at well child checks until the child reaches six years of age. Screenings are accomplished via blood from a finger or heel prick, especially if the child is younger. If this test reveals a blood lead level of five micrograms per deciliter or higher, a second blood test, generally a venous blood draw from the arm, should be scheduled to confirm the blood lead level. It's not unusual for an initial test to show a false positive. That's why we need the venous blood draw to make a definitive diagnosis. Some physicians will perform the capillary test in their office using the lead check. This will provide the parents of the children with their blood lead level on site. However, not everyone has access to a lead check. So in this case, blood is sent to a laboratory for analysis and results are available within a few days. So we've talked about lead dust and lead chip ingestion. There are other sources of lead in the home that we need to consider. Lead may leach into water if a home contains lead plumbing, which is unlikely, copper plumbing joined with lead solder, or brass fixtures or faucets. Here's a tip that you can pass along to your parents and patients to reduce risk. Allow water to run for two minutes or so until it reaches the coldest temperature. This will allow any lead malingering in the pipes to be flushed out. Lead may also leach into foods or liquids if served in leaded crystal. Leaded crystal is among those objects that are lovely to behold, but better left to ornamentation. Food and liquids can easily cause lead content to leach, especially where edibles are warm or acidic. What about infant formula reconstituted with water? Infant formula requiring reconstitution should be made only with water from the cold water tap. Flush the tap for at least three minutes before use and then heat the water or use bottled or filtered tap water known to be free of lead. So in the home we have lead action levels. The standard action level is 0.015 parts per million. We want to consider our sources, our lead pipes, plumbing, brass, well construction, and pumps. We recommend that homeowners test every three to five years, also testing the pH, especially in homes where there are children under six years old. These are the children at the highest risk. We need to test to determine the presence of lead. It is odorless, tasteless, and colorless. You also want to suggest to your parents and patients that they avoid lead in consumer goods. You want to beware of inexpensive imported items that you might bring into the home. This includes ceramic, especially ceramic that's marked as not for use for food. The paint and glaze on these ceramic items may contain lead. You also want to consider cheaper imported plastic and vinyl. Lead is used in these for stability. You might want to consider vinyl mini blinds that use lead as a stabilizer. Children's toys and jewelry may also contain higher elevated lead levels. You can find a list of items that have been recalled due to lead content on the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission website. See the link below. When educating parents and patients, please consider the additional lead sources provided here. Occupational lead exposure can be found in manufacturing ammunition, batteries, chemical compounds, explosives, glassware, and metal products. Spices including turmeric, chili powder, and vanilla, 
Red pepper, cumin, coriander, and anise may also contain trace amounts of lead. Lead can also be found in cosmetics. Typically, lead is found in a color additive. This is limited to 10 to 20 parts per million. You want to consider coal, which often has high amounts of lead used in eye makeup. Lead may also be found in hair dyes, lipstick, and may be found along with other potentially harmful additives. Many imported products, including children's jewelry and toys, may contain lead. Lead has also been found in some candies that have been imported. Certain candy ingredients such as chili powder and tamarind may be a source of lead exposure. As we said earlier, lead can only be determined to be present in the home through testing. Professionals can test paint, household products, and water for the presence of lead. Lead-based paint inspection will reveal whether or not a home contains lead-based paint, and if so, where. Consumers may also want to undergo a lead risk assessment, which will reveal whether or not lead hazards currently exist in the home's paint, dust, or soil. These tests need to be done by certified inspectors and assessors. They cannot be done by the home consumer. The National Lead Information Center at 1-800-424-LEAD can provide consumers with a list of certified companies in their area. A common and very valid question you might encounter is, can I test my home or my things myself? For those tests described on this slide, the answer is no, as all require the expertise and safe handling that only a professional can provide. Here's a list of testing types. We have paint chip analysis that tests for the presence of lead on walls or surfaces. It requires removal of all paint layers with samples sent to the laboratory for determination. We also have x-ray fluorescence, which can be used on walls, furniture, toys, or other objects. Certified technicians can perform testing in the home with a portable unit or in their own laboratory. Laboratory testing is reserved for objects only. A dissolving agent is used on the item surface to test for and weigh lead content. Wait, what about those little test kits that are sold in stores? This is also a question that you may encounter. We need to reiterate that many retail outlets sell color change test kits called swab tests. These are inexpensive and can be used to detect lead but are not recommended because it may detect presence on the surface but not within the deeper layers of the object or lead paint. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission has conducted numerous tests and determined that these kits are unreliable. They often reveal false negatives. A chemical agent must directly contact and dissolve a lead surface to detect lead content. Many times, the lead may be too deep for contact, or the amount of lead does not ignite the chemical process. Interpretation of the color change is also somewhat nebulous. Consumers may also be interested in water testing. You can refer them to contact a certified laboratory for testing of their tap water. Local water utilities and health departments should also be able to provide a list of certified testing companies in their area. The test company should provide you with sample containers and comprehensive instructions. You must follow the instructions exactly and send the sample to the laboratory for analysis. In the meantime, if someone's concerned about water testing or elevated lead levels in the water, consider a filtration system. The EPA maintains a safe drinking water hotline that you can encourage people to call at 1-800-426 Four seven nine one. So now that we know about testing for lead in our patients and in their homes, let's talk a little bit more about lead poisoning prevention strategies. First, we want to consider when the home was built. If a home was built before 1978, we encourage our consumers to test the house and property for lead. This is also something that you can encourage patients and parents to do immediately, maintain strict cleanliness standards. This includes wet mopping floors and damp cleaning windowsills and other surfaces with soap and warm water at least weekly. Damp cleaning is especially important as dry cleaning allows dust to become airborne and inhalable. 
We encourage caregivers to wash children's hands and toys thoroughly and often. Use cold water for drinking and cooking and be certain to have children tested for elevated blood lead levels. If someone discovers that their home contains lead, they might be interested in renovation and remodeling. Here are some tips for how to do that safely. We highly encourage people to hire a professional. Under the 2010 Renovation, Repair, and Painting legislation, it demands that all professionals hired for remodeling work in homes or child-occupied facilities constructed prior to 1978, receive training and certification in lead-safe work practices. So if you're considering hiring a contractor, you want to be certain to verify that the firm is certified. You can find out which RRP certified companies are in your area by going to the EPA's website. However, if someone chooses to manage lead in their home on their own, here are some basics for homeowners that you can encourage. Personal protection is a must. Personal protection is the first defense against accidental lead exposure. If someone's choosing to renovate their home themselves, we highly encourage the use of coveralls, painter's hats, shoe covers, gloves, a respirator, and goggles. It's also essential to contain and minimize any dust, especially lead-containing dust. Here are some important tips for containment and dust minimization. You want to make sure to keep dust in and keep everyone except the workers out. So remove all furnishings before starting work. Turn off your forced air, heat, or air conditioning. Cover the door, floor, or carpeting and all duct openings with plastic sheeting secured by tape. As with our wet mopping and wet dusting, we also want to avoid dry scraping or sanding. Instead, we want to use wet sanders and moist surfaces to prevent the aerosolization of lead dust. Use only low temperature heat guns. That's 1000 degrees or less. You're also going to want to score painted surfaces with a utility knife before cutting or separating. We also encourage consumers to pry and pull apart rather than hammering or pounding. This also minimizes the amount of dust that gets sent up into the air. The last thing that we want consumers to consider is the end of project cleaning. This is something that can be forgotten after the labor is over. Careful, thorough cleaning upon project completion is imperative. This makes sure that dust doesn't settle in the house after all of the hard work that you've done or get out into the environment again. You want to make sure to mist all plastic sheeting and fold with the dirty side inward. This will keep the dust inside the sheeting. You want to seal these in sturdy plastic bags for disposal so that the plastic bags don't tear and the dust doesn't end up in the environment. Damp cleaning all surfaces is very important. You want to work from top to bottom. If possible, you also want to vacuum your walls and floors with a HEPA vacuum to prevent any aerosolization. Mopping and cleaning all tools before removing from the home are additional ways to prevent lead dust exposure. So the Mississippi Lead Poisoning Prevention and Healthy Homes Program has done some analysis on lead exposure in children. Between 2012 and 2016, our surveillance report shows reported blood lead test data from providers and laboratories for children less than 72 months of age in Mississippi. The goal of this program is to reduce the number of children exposed to lead and environmental hazards through strategies focused on increasing public awareness of risk of lead poisoning and environmental hazards, and through collaboration with community and faith-based organizations to facilitate community awareness and prevention activities. On this slide, you can see the blood lead levels and follow-up guidelines, and also the Mississippi Lead Poisoning Prevention and Healthy Homes Program's role in education. Here you can see the number of children that were tested for lead poisoning between 2012 and 2016. The average screening rate was only 17%. Screening rates fluctuated during 2012 to 2016, 
with the lowest rate of 16.1% in 2016 and the highest rate of 19.7% in 2014. So we're seeing actually a decrease in our screening initiatives in patients. This is the number of children that showed elevated blood lead levels by year in Mississippi. We're happy to see the number going down between 2012 and 2015, but as of 2016, we've seen a slight increase in the number of children affected. This breaks down our numbers a little bit further. You can see the number of children treated and the number of children with elevated blood lead levels. So that's higher than five micrograms per deciliter. And you can also see the percentage of children in Mississippi with elevated blood lead levels from almost 1% in 2012 to 0.71% overall. Now we want to emphasize that no detected lead level is considered acceptable. Greater than 5 micrograms per deciliter, however, is considered elevated. This chart breaks down further the elevated blood levels found in the children in the previous slide. The majority have blood lead levels of 5 to 9 micrograms per deciliter. However, you can still see a large amount of children with elevated blood levels higher than that, and this is where we start to see serious health complications and developmental delays. This chart emphasizes that the number of children with elevated blood lead levels has been decreasing since 2012. However, we still saw 44 more children with elevated blood lead levels in the range of 5 to 9 micrograms per deciliter in 2016 than in 2015. This breaks down the data based on age. We're seeing the highest rate of elevated blood lead levels in our children that are 2 and 3 years old. The highest percentage of children with confirmed elevated blood lead levels were 2 years of age, followed by 3 years of age. Here you can see that there is a discrepancy in the percentage of children with elevated blood levels based on Medicaid status. You can also see the concentration of children with elevated blood lead levels by county here on this map. You'll notice that we are seeing higher rates of elevated blood levels in children that live in the Mississippi Delta. Other counties, however, are also susceptible. Here are some additional lead resources that you can share with patients and caregivers and providers. You can see the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency website, the National Lead Information Center, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These websites are valuable resources for all things lead prevention and education. This concludes our presentation on healthy homes and lead prevention. Let's reflect on the application of this presentation. How can this information be useful for you in your practice with your patients and caregivers and providers? Sources for the information found on these slides can be found here in references. If you have any further questions, please go to the Mississippi State University Extension Service website.